All right, what's good guys? Welcome back to another video. And if this is your first time here, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. And as you guys can see, we got a special guest, V1 and V only, Elijah Lamb. Um, so introduce yourself to the people, your ministry, what you do on TikTok and how that came about and all that stuff, all that good stuff. Cool, stop. Uh, so hi, I'm Elijah. Um, I do uh, online ministry on TikTok. Um, that's been something I've been doing for like a year and a half now, which is it's mind blowing. I got started there summer of 2019. Um, and it's a platform I used to teach and to preach. Um, you know, I have a, I have an account where I teach doctrine and then I have my other account where I'll, where I'll make preaching videos and I have a weekly live stream I do on there. And just through that, um, I actually just finished uh, my first full length, like series, um, more, more professionally, I guess, uh, last night, it was a 12 week long thing. Um, and man, through TikTok, I've seen like just people, my own life has changed, but people's lives have changed. I mean, I've seen thousands of souls saved um, through the ministry that God has given Amazing. me. And it is, it's incredible. It's mind blowing. Um, my story, um, I, gr I grew up in the church, but I was by no means a Christian. Um, I, I grew up in a, a family that went to church, but a family that was not the church at home. So I didn't have a lot of reflections of Christ um, in my home and in my home life. Um, and it, it's wild to me how God has totally regenerated and, and, and changed my family even. Um, most of my childhood, my parents were both uh, deeply stuck in alcoholism, especially uh, yeah, my parents um, for, for a long time. And right around the time I got saved, which was on a mission trip in Mexico um, after my eighth grade year, um, so about three and a half years ago, um, right around that time, my, because of God's grace, basically my mom got sick and, um, the doctor was basically like, you cannot drink anymore um, or it's going to kill you. And so she had to stop drinking and my, my dad decided to stop drinking with her. And it was because of that, that she began to take interest in the word of God and in church. And now my mom is someone who reads the Bible more than anyone I know. Same as my, same with my dad. And so it's like all three of our lives change at the same time, um, me, I came, just me personally, I, I came to Christ as a completely broken person, um, just struggling with mental health and um, with a lot of bad influences, a lot of bad relationships, um, you know, just very, very, very torn apart and alone. I've struggled with loneliness like my whole life. Um, and it was like, I, I knew about Jesus. In fact, I knew a ton about the Bible just from you know, the group I came up through, it came up in as a kid and, you know, my kids program in my church and just, just the way I was. Um, but I didn't know God. I didn't really know Jesus. Um, and, you know, if I had stood before him, he would have said, depart from me. I never knew you. Um, and so I was very, very far from God. And I came to him for the first time and finally was just like, I have nowhere else to go. Um, and got down on my knees and just wept and, and repented and, and truly decided to truly, truly came to a belief um, in Jesus and the fact that he rose again from the grave and for the first time confessed that Christ was Lord without even knowing that that was in the scripture, which is crazy. I didn't have a moment where someone was like, okay, pray this prayer with me. It was just for the first time, my life didn't belong to me anymore. And so I was just there and just surrendering everything to God and just saying like, I am yours, you know, do, do with me what you will and take everything else. You know, I lay, I lay what is, I lay the evil in me at the cross and I lay what is good in me before your throne. Like every, I lay my sin at the cross and I lay everything else at the throne for you to handle. And it was just like, I mean, that's like Lordship salvation, right? Like that's, you know, Romans 10, nine, if you confess your mouth that Christ is Lord, you'll be saved, right? Like I didn't even know that was in the scripture. And that was something that the Holy Spirit um, cried out for me, you know? Um, and it was just, I was at this point where like, it, Jesus was so beautiful for the first time. There was nothing I could do to, to say no or resist that, uh, which is great. So that's, that's my story. That's, that's who I am. That's what I'm about. I love that. That's beautiful. And like I told you, it's been amazing to see what God has done through you. I, I was at a point, and I'm going to tell you this because it's crazy because I was at a point, I think in like beginning of this year, beginning of this year, February, where people, there was nobody around me my age, um, 18, who was really on fire for God the way I was, who loved the scriptures the way I did, and who loved theology. And I'm not saying this in an arrogant way. It was just yeah. like there was nobody around me. And so I, I downloaded TikTok, right? Um, just for fun, because everybody's a hype, you know? This is my first year on TikTok, so. And then I got on Christian TikTok, and with some of the first people I saw was Georgia, and then you. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. These are kids my age preaching the gospel. Like, the gospel, like, because you know this, there's a lot of kids who really want to, to make an impact, but 
they got it wrong in a lot of places. And, and it's very important that we get the gospel right. But you and her, we got the gospel right. And it was just so beautiful and so encouraging. And it made me motivated. Um, I have a preaching gift and I was just so unmotivated um, because I just never saw anyone my age. And seeing you guys was just like, wow. This, I, yeah. Because you know, you know the story where um, Elijah and he was telling God, I'm, a, I'm the only prophet. I'm the only one out here who's doing your will. And God was like, shut up. No, you're not. There's 7,000 other, other doing the same thing that you're doing. So that's really the moment. That's the kind of the moment that I had. Um, just saying, God, I'm alone. And he's like, no, you're not. There's many people doing this. Right. And it was just very, very encouraging. So I love what, what God's doing through you. Um, so yeah, as you guys may know, we're in a series called What is Calvinism? Um, last week, we did Total Depravity. I did that. Um, we speak about how we are, not that we are utterly depraved, but that we are morally unable to choose God apart from him sovereignly pouring out his grace towards us because of the disposition of our heart. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 36 that we have a heart of stone apart from him changing that heart of stone and making it a heart of flesh and giving us the ability to choose him. So basically, Reformed theology stands on this phrase, regeneration precedes faith that God has to first regenerate you and then make you alive. And then that's when you are able to place your faith in him. And today we're going to be talking about um, irresistible grace. And we skipped the U and the L, but we went all the way to the I, irresistible grace for a specific reason. Because like I said, we talked about total depravity. We're unable to choose him. But irresistible grace is how he makes us alive. He pours his grace out towards us and we cannot resist that. Um, because he chooses to, to save you. And if God decrees something, um, this is called his decorative will. If God decrees to do something and he wants to do something, it's going to happen. Um, and if he wants to save somebody, it's going to happen. So that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Um, so Elijah, if you got anything to say um, about his visible grace, you can start um, speaking on it. Yeah, I'm mute. Okay, cool. Well, I love that you bring up uh, total depravity in the order of this, um, because I, I, I agree with you that these two things should go one after the other, um, because irresistible grace, from the reform standpoint, is the logical answer to total yeah. depravity. If man is totally depraved, then he will always use his free will to deny God. He will always, because he is depraved. So there is no instance in which a depraved person can say yes to God. So God actually has to overcome our will. Um, I'm not a, a hater of Stephen Furtick. I'm not a, a part of this group that calls him a, a yeah, heretic, but he has this one teaching that the one thing God can't do is overcome mm -hmm. your unbelief. But we as reform people, that's exactly what we believe he does, is he actually has to overcome my unbelief because I can't. I yeah. am depraved and I will always be stuck in this hole myself unless someone else pulls yeah. me out. And so the notion of irresistible grace is that upon God's choosing, that he has alone the power to overcome our total depravity which is why I, I'm, I love that these two things go together um, a lot of people mischaracterize irresistible grace as to say that God um, forces people into salvation that um, that he that he simply takes our will away see I disagree with that and I believe that most reformed people acknowledge the paradoxical like unless you're a hard determinist which basically is the idea that we have no free will and reality is determined where I'm a soft determinist. And I believe that we have free will, but reality is determined. And so I think God operates in, in paradox a lot. I mean, that's sort of the way we explain the Trinity is it's not a contradiction. It's just mystery that there's missing information. Right. Um, and so a lot of people think that they'll say, do you believe in free will or predestination? And it's like, I believe in both of those things just, through the right lens, right? I believe that I have the free will, but I believe that if, if my free will is left alone and grace is not given, then I will always use it to say yes or to say no to God. And if, if grace is given to me, then my yeah. free will will be used to say yes to God, right? So mm -hmm. it's swaying one way or the other. I am still making the choice, but the way I love to explain your, your irresistible grace is that it is outside of man when given grace to say no. Right. Mm, and that's the difference yeah. between irresistible grace and prevenient grace, um, which is the, the Arminian thought. Um, mm -hmm. Both acknowledge that no one can come to, to Christ except by the moving of the Holy Spirit, which we get um, from Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six, which says. Oh, this is not the right verse. What happened? One second. 
You good? Oh, there it is. It's from First Corinthians twelve three. Sorry, where it says yeah. it says. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So, both groups acknowledge that reality that salvation can only come when the Lord wills it, right? But provenient grace is basically the idea that God gives us enough grace so that we can overcome our depravity, and at that point, we can choose. Yeah, yeah. That's confusing for me, right? That is their answer to, to depravity, to, to man's um, sinfulness. I don't understand that. I, I get people make that argument. I understand where it's coming from, but I don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, right? Because at the end of the day, that still places salvation in the hands of mankind, right? It still says, well, this is up to man, right? It's up to God to an extent, but then man takes it into his own hands and he deals with it from there, um, which I don't understand. Um, right. So prevenient mm -hmm. grace is the idea that, that God gives grace to individuals that basically it releases us and it separates us from our depravity to a point where we have the willpower to say yes to God or to say no, mm. which I don't agree with. Um, and the analogy that I love to use to explain how irresistible grace works, and I, I keep saying irresistible grace, but, but the, the, the analogy I, I always give and the one I love to use is this idea that, okay, so just simply imagine, I have it written, so I'm just going to read it to you. Um, imagine this, okay, so from birth, we have all been trapped ourselves. We've all trapped ourselves, chosen this for ourselves. We have trapped ourselves in a one foot by one foot prison cell, okay, so we're trapped like this and mm -hmm. stuck to the walls. It is dark, there's no lights, you can't sit, right? You can't lay down, right? It's hard to breathe, there's very little airflow. It is, it's gross, it smells bad, right? You've been in there for a long time, it's, it's painful, like you're cramped up, it's claustrophobic, there's no food, um, so you've never eaten, there's no rest, you've never slept, there's no communication with anyone outside. It is nothing but sufferable loneliness, right? And maybe at some point someone outside the cell has, has even knocked and in our stubbornness we have told them to go away, right? That would be our, total depravity. But alas, someone swings open the prison door for the first time. My question is for you, if you were in that situation, do you think you would even, you would have the willpower to say no to that offer, to reject it? If freedom is offered, I would say it is totally outside of the prisoner's ability to say no, right? Their, their intuition, their, 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 who they are naturally has no choice but to say yes. It is not because they're being forced. They are still making the choice to take a step outside of that prison cell, but they do not have the means by which to say no. And that's how it is to God, right? For the first time, God flings open that door. We see light for the first time. There is no man who has it in, in himself to say no to God when grace is offered. Amen. Because God that. can offer nothing greater, right? Like we, there's nothing greater that can be offered to man. That, that's just the whole point. So that's the way I view it. And I think that um, again, if we believe in total depravity, that it's logically impossible to believe in salvation if you don't believe in irresistible grace, um, unless the provenient grace route is taken, but I just don't see a biblical foundation for that um, at all. I think the Bible says we're dead in sin, right? It's sort mm -hmm. of like Lazarus. Lazarus was dead, and Jesus did not say, okay, Lazarus, if you want to come out, I'm here now. You have the choice now. And he, says, he says, Lazarus, get up, come out. And he calls Lazarus in his, in his deadness to come out. It's um, Shai Lin, if you know who that is, the, the Christian yeah, yeah, song. He explains basically like the, the Armenian, Armenian thought, Ar Armenian thought is that we are, you know, we're, we're in the ocean, we're surrounded by waves and we need someone to throw us a raft, right? Mm -hmm. It's in our choice to say, okay, I'm going to grab onto this raft. But what, he, what he'll say is, no, I'm dead at the bottom of the ocean. I can't save myself or choose to be rescued because I'm dead. I that that's it. I'm dead. Like that's, there's, there's not like you're dead. Right. And the question is, what can a, a dead man do? Can a dead man say yes or no? I don't think yeah. so. And so that's I actually good. need God. What he's referencing. What'd you say? Yeah. Yeah. My fault. My fault. No, I was just trying to tell the people because what he's referencing, he keeps saying we're dead. We're dead. Ephesians 2, 1. And you were dead. Plain and simple. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Watch this. And we were by nature children of wrath. Our natures were opposed to God. We hated God. But then verse four, but God, being rich in mercy, he made us alive together with Christ. So that's basically what he's saying, that we are dead in the bottom of the sea, not able to swim. We can't do anything. God has to come in the sea and come pick us up because we don't want God. We don't want him. We're dead in our sin. Like you said, John 11, Lazarus. Jesus didn't say, 
I'm giving you the opportunity, Lazarus. Do you want to? Lazarus, please come. No, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Um, so, yeah, that's what he's referencing. Right. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 3 through 6. I want to read this. This is God talking to Ezekiel. He says, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he says, I, I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Right, you alone know this. And then he says, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord has said to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover your skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. It is not if you want to come life, you to come to life, you can. If you want breath, you can have it. If you want flesh, you can have it. No, you are dead. You are a valley of dry bones. And I alone, Ezekiel says, you alone, you alone, you Lord alone know, and you alone, Lord, can say to the dry bones, I will make breath into you. I will bring you to life. Like God alone can give life to the dead. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of all of this. And if, if, if grace is not irresistible, then that means I become a little less dead and choose life in abundance. No, that's not, that's not how it works, right? And, yeah. and I mean, just from a logical standpoint, we would never come to that conclusion. And so that's why I don't understand it. Um, and I think irresistible grace is, is one of those things. I don't think Calvinism is a perfect view, right? I think we're, like I said, operating in, in paradox. And I think that irresistible grace is just one of those things that is biblical. Um, and I don't see any argument against it, um, especially not from a scriptural basis. You can, especially John 6, John 6, 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. All that the father gives will yeah. come. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Unless we are drawn, we cannot come. Right? And then there's this beautiful verse in Acts 16, 14, where um, the, 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 the apostles or, or Paul is going to Lydia, right? The seller yeah. of purple, purple yeah. goods. And, and it literally says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention. Yeah. The Lord opened her heart, right? Like and this comes from Romans 9. And you can even look at Exodus that the heart is in the hands of God. Whether or not it's going to be hardened or softened is completely in the hands of God, right? And so I think, I think of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not by works that no one may boast. So no one may boast. Here's the thing, though. If we are all offered the same level of grace, and we all have a choice of yes or no, and one man says no, and I say yes, there is a right answer to God, right? There, the, the right answer is yes. The better choice is yes. But I have no reason to boast. Listen, if, if, I can, if one can say no and one can say yes, the one who says yes has a reason to boast. Mm. Because they were yeah. wiser. They were smarter. They understood it better. Right? But what has a dead man to boast if he is brought to life by someone else? Nothing. And so this is the point. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 crushed the view that we choose, that we say to God yes or no. Because whoever says yes does have a reason to boast. Salvation is entirely in the hands of God. We never see salvation in the Bible given in responsibility to anyone but God, to anyone but God. And there is no scripture that I'm aware of that ascribes salvation to man in any way or leaves, the, the, or, or leaves salvation in the hands of mankind at all. Amen. I agree. Yeah. And it just, like you said, what, what do we have to boast? And I think when I became a Calvinist, it just changed the way I worship. It really did change the way I worship because it brought my worship to a high level because I understood how depraved I truly was. I understood what really took place in my conversion. I went from death to life. Um, and when you understand that, it will take your worship to a higher level because you just understand, I really don't deserve this. This really should have never happened, but because of God's sovereign grace and his love, he allowed me to be made alive. Romans 9 says it does not depend on human will or exertion. Not on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It depends all on his mercy and all on his grace. And apart from his grace, we will not be able to choose him. And when he decides to save a sinner, and this is what this is all about. When he decides to save a sinner, that sinner will be saved. He was, he's not a failure. He's not a failure. And I think Arminian theology, and this may sound crazy, but hear me out. Arminian theology makes it seem like God is the biggest failure. It really does. It makes it seem like God is trying his hardest to draw all men to himself, but he can't. He, 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 he's end, he ends up not doing it because there are going to be people in hell. But he's trying. He's trying to draw everybody. And the Arminian view of John 6.44 is that no man can come to me unless the Father draws. 
is basically they're saying that God is drawing everyone. But if you look at the Greek word for draw, the word draw in John 6, 44, it's the word elko. And it basically means compel, literally to compel. And we see this word used um, in Acts chapter 16, where Paul um, was being dragged to go to court. Literally, they were pulling him by force. And that's the same word in Acts chapter 16 that John used in John 6, 44, compel, to drag, literally drag you out from death, drag you out from the grave. And that's what Christ did in our salvation. He poured his irresistible grace upon us and he dragged us out from the grave and he brought us from death to life. It's a beautiful thing. Um, do you have anything else to add? Um, yeah, just quickly. Uh, a lot of people will respond to this and they'll say, but of course man can resist to the Holy Spirit, right? We see that sometimes in the scripture. And so this is not irresistible grace. The assertion is not that, that man can never resist the Holy Spirit, but it is that when, in, when God chooses, right, he can overcome all of our resistance. Mm. Like that's the point. So, so like there are times when the Holy Spirit can convict me and I can ignore that. Right. But when we're talking specifically about the point of salvation, if God wants to overcome my resistance, he can, and he will, and he must to save man. He must. Right. Because like I said, we will always use our depravity in our depravity. We will always use our free will to deny God every time, every time. And so something else has to overcome us and change us so that we can right? Like, Amen. again, I'll read the verse once more just to finish up here. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is there, you cannot say Jesus is a curse. So if you said no, then the Holy Spirit was never moving in the first place. Amen. Agreed. So yeah, um, you know, on TikTok, it's been a sudden surge of young Calvinists. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's cool. You know, it's, it's cool. Um, it it kind of gets annoying sometimes because you see a lot of them with zeal. I mean, I, I mean, I don't necessarily believe in Kate State Calvinists, but they're just too zealous sometimes and stuff. That, I mean, and, that's um, the common like stance of Calvinists. So that's like the big thing people have against Calvinists is that Calvinists can tend to be very yeah. prideful and very arrogant. Like a lot of Calvinists yes. come from where they're just like, this is it. This is the one way to believe. You know, you have Calvinists who take it too far sometimes and say, you know what, if you don't believe in Calvinism, you don't believe in the gospel. And they'll throw around that Charles Spurgeon quote, like, like it's the scripture, you know, where Charles Spurgeon says Calvinism is the gospel. And while I think that's a great quote and I agree with it, at the end of the day, like Charles Spurgeon is not God, right? Yeah. Um, and that's not scripture. So, so it, it, that's, that quote doesn't actually mean anything. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of haughty, um, arrogant Calvinists and, you know, like, I, I mean, theology opens up the doors to arrogance sometimes because it is the, oh, I'm smarter than people now. I get this a little bit more. I can throw around these big terms and it, it does, it can lead to arrogance in the same, arrogance in the same way where it's like, I figured it out. Mm -hmm. This is it. And so I think that Calvinism, Calvinists especially need humility. Um, and we should, we should have humility. Like, we believe in total depravity. We believe in irresistible grace. That's what I'm saying. You are who you are because of nothing you've done. Exactly. No, every good gift comes from above, John, John the Baptist said, right? Every gift comes from above, right? Like, no one has anything unless it is given to them from heaven. And, and he says in, the, in that same passage, I must become less and he must become more. I must be decreasing. He must be increasing. And so Calvinism should lead us to glorify God, not ourselves. And the crazy exactly. error that Calvinists make is saying, oh, well, this is about me. I get it. I'm smarter. No, no. First of all, your salvation, if you have it, it is by the grace of God. And any knowledge you gain, if you gain it, it is by the grace of God. Amen. Your mind is softened to the Holy Spirit to learn. And so, but yeah, I, I observe that same thing and it's frustrating sometimes, but. And yeah, and that's what it makes, it makes Calvinism look bad because of the Calvinist. I mean, well, who, who's that guy? Um, who's the leader of Buddhism? Is it Buddhism? I think it's the leader of Buddhism. Not like the leader currently? of Buddhism. No, 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 not him, not him. It's, um, he's Dalai very Lama? famous. No, no, no. I don't even think it's Buddhism at this point, but he's mad. Gandhi, Gandhi, Gandhi. Gandhi. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. He said, he said, I love your Christ, but I don't love your Christians. And I think it can be applied in Calvinism as well, because, because a lot of us are just so arrogant. It's just like, I don't want to be there because you guys think you guys know everything. And like he just said, Calvinism should make you more humble. It shouldn't make you more arrogant because when you really understand you were totally depraved that your salvation was in, it was a monergistic work of God. You should be humbled. You, you, there's no room for arrogance in Calvinism. I don't understand how there are so many Calvinists who are arrogant. It kind of bothers me. But um, 
You know, I love I love to talk about um, tulip and and um, Augustinianism and Calvinism and these things. Um, you know, be, because I think they're biblical and I think they're important. But it it gets it's a frustrating conversation sometimes from either end um, because yeah. you'll have people because everyone is just so certain, and that's what frustrates me is because I love to talk. There are certain parts of Calvinism that I'm certain on, right? Total depravity, irresistible grace, and and the perseverance of the saints. I think are simply biblical, and I don't see any room for them. I don't see any biblical like argument for any other view for those three things. But when we, when we talk about the parts of, of Calvinism people don't like, there's a reason that they don't like them because they've hit passages yeah. in the Bible that, that, that in their mind contradict those things, right? Like it's awesome, you know, for a Calvinist to read Romans 8 through 10 until you read 11 through 14. And it's like, what, what just happened, right? Like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, like that's, that's literally what happened to me. I remember I read it and I was like, yes, this makes sense. And then I read 10 and I, or I, yeah, or 10 or 11. And I was just like, what happened? What happened? What, what, whoa, things just flipped on me. So I understand it. I, I, I understand people's views um, and I get it. So that's what we need to be as Christians is like, okay, you've come to that conclusion. I get it. I get it. I understand why you, why you think that way, right? Like that needs to be what happens instead of I view this way. And if you don't view this way, if you don't yeah. think the same way as me, you must be wrong, right? That's, yeah, what that's happens. annoying. That's terrible because like we need to be able, my fault, bro. No, you're um, good. Yeah, well, we need to be able to have civil disagreements and civil conversations. Because I see it, like I said, I'll bring up TikTok again, but I'm not going to name drop. But there's this, this dude, he's kind of older than all of us. He's kind of the grandpa of TikTok, uh, Christian TikTok. But he, he makes these videos against Calvinism in such an arrogant way. And it's just like, I'm right. And if you disagree with me, you're just bad at theology and you don't study the Bible. That's not the way we have to handle these things. And, you know, I mean, we're not perfect. Of course, we're going to be, we're going to have our flaws. And Martin Luther was a man that if you disagreed with him, like he would just excommunicate you and he wouldn't talk to you anymore. I mean, we're not, we're not claiming to be perfect, but, um, but we should strive for unity in the gospel, Arminianism or Calvinism. I know Arminians who are on fire for God, who are preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I just think that they get it wrong in their soteriology. And that's okay, because it's not going to send them to hell. But I do want them to be a Calvinist. I'm not going to act like I don't want them to be a Calvinist. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm going to have discussions with them. This is the reason why I'm making this video, because I think Calvinism is just so beautiful, and it can bring your worship to a higher level. But if you so happen to disagree with me on Calvinism, that's okay. You're not going to go to hell for that. Um, and I think I think that we need to have these discussions and have civil discussions, right. um, and everything, and in politics, in Christianity, and the everything, um, civil discussions, especially as Christians. People on the outside can't be looking inside and looking at us and see that we ourselves can't have civil discussions. That's that's terrible. And that's the thing, um, you know, you have, you know, a lot of Calvinists fail to convey the convey the beauty of Calvinism, and you'll find Arminians and people who aren't Calvinists who simply call it heresy. We call it mm. false teaching. And it's like, you really think? You think like, whoa, like why would I believe something that inherently rips the gospel of its beauty? Why would I do that? Like, why would I believe in this unless I thought that it, it gave God more glory, right? Unless, unless, unless I thought it was biblical, right? It's, it's ridiculous yeah. to me the way people are so quick on the other side to just be like, it's wrong. It's heresy. It's bad. It's like, wow. Okay, like, where are you getting that, you know? And, and that's the thing, man, is that I really do see Calvinism as so beautiful. Like, and people don't get that. But I mean, even on the topic of irresistible grace, like, I didn't stand a chance. I say, thank God his grace is irresistible. Because if it wasn't, I would have resisted it. And I know that about myself. I yeah. know that I would have resisted it. If I had yeah. a choice, I would have said no. I know that. So thank God that it was outside of me to say no. And I worship him for that. Like that is beautiful. That is, it's, it's, it's incredible. If God's grace was not resistible, it was irresist, was not irresistible. I know where I would be going and it would not be heaven. Right. Yeah. So that's just the beauty. The beauty in it is that God didn't have to make his grace irresistible, but he did. And so Amen. it's, it's incredible. So, yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, um, if you can, if you can't, that's okay too. But off the top of the dome, could you think of a major objection to irresistible grace or Calvinism in general? Off the, if you can, that's okay too, because I can't even shake them one right now either. Well, basically, I mean, the, the straw man, the, the most common is just the idea that like, why would God choose? You know, why would God choose? God died for everyone. Um, 
that's the most common. To irresistible grace, it's a bit harder. Um, I mean, the way I find is just that if people believe that you're, like that they did choose, or or rather that irresistible grace is not true, and that we do say yes or no. Like what I say to them is, so do you think that you said like that you had a choice? Like, do you think yeah. that it was within your strength to say yes to God? Yeah. Because I don't think that about myself. I know that I have no reason to boast. When I think of my salvation, I don't think of it as a moment where I, where I had a choice. I was there and I said, this is the only option. Yeah. This is it. Like, that was just the way that, that my heart was, like, um, fixtured at that point. And that's because that was the Holy Spirit in my heart. Right? Because no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so I think uh, irresistible grace is really not one of those concepts that people have a lot of pr- trouble with. Um, yeah, that's true. It's just, it's just what irresistible grace is in because it's in, unless like it, it works within election, right? Um, so you can, you can, I think you can believe um, in irresistible grace without believing in election um, to an extent. You would just have to believe then in universalism. <laughs> so it doesn't okay. work right? because, because everyone would have to be saved. Um, and so, and that's why I think um, prevenient grace is a thing because it's like, oh, well, his grace can't be irresistible. Otherwise we would all be saved. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know, man, I, we're talking about the holy God of the universe, but the God yeah. who created everything and everything is in his hands. And it says, it says that the nations are, are like a drop in the bucket for him, right? They're like the dust on the, on the scales that he, he, he puts princes under his feet and makes them nothing. We're talking about that God. And we think, we think that he's not in complete and sovereign control of salvation. We think that he would give a grace that is resistible. Yeah. Like we think that he would give a grace that is not so strong and so beautiful and compassionate that we would, that we would ever conceive to say no to it. I don't yeah, know. Man. I think, I think that irresistible grace is about the Holy spirit opening our eyes to the beauty of God's grace and opening our eyes to the, to, to the, dis- to the disgusting nature of our surroundings. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. It's, it's, it's not even, I mean, it's, there's not even a moment of, of confusion. Like, when God's grace is offered, there's not a moment where I look and say, oh, but what about this? What about these things? It's like, no, that's it. That's, that, that's it. You know, it is the beautiful thing surrounded by so much evil. I'm not going to look left and right. I don't care about what's on my sides or behind me. It's this is the thing, right? Like this is literally what I was made for. And man, when the Holy Spirit convicts man's, a man's heart and softens it, he knows that. He knows that. That's beautiful. That's amazing. Um, I think it's about understanding your true nature and it's really the question goes out to is man sovereign or is God sovereign? And if the answer is God, there you have it. There's your answer. The answer can't be both, man. It can't, it can't be both. at all. It cannot. But we're sovereign together. You know, there's a there's a joke in, in the show The Office where where Oscar says, you know, oh yeah, the Vatican and the two popes. Like we're looting, like that wouldn't work. That would not work. It just <laughs> right. Yeah. So we, we can't be God and man can't be equally or varying, like at various levels, sovereign over salvation. It's either one person is totally in control because that's what sovereign implies, that you have complete control. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's not divided. It's not a divided sovereignty, right? Yeah. And we, we think about the nations before that have been divided, right? Like Ale- after Alexander the Great had died, mm-hmm. we, look at, we look at Greece and it was divided into all these smaller rulers and then fell apart almost immediately. Because yeah. we are made to be ruled over as, as human people and our hearts were made to be ruled by something, but by one source, right? That's why we surrender to God. That's why we are servants or slaves to God, right? The Greek word, the, the Greek word gnosko, we are, we are completely under the authority of God. That's how it's made to be. So we can't say, God, you have all authority, but also me a little bit too. <laughs> yep, like yep. if you believe that God is completely sovereign and has authority over all mankind and believe in a synergistic salvation, I don't, I don't understand that. Either you believe that God has a weaker sovereignty or that you have a stronger sovereignty than, than the reality. That's what it comes down to. Again, the reality is that I am not sovereign at all. That God, that we, again, that I do believe in free will, but free will that is subjected to the will of God, right? So in, in my life as a believer, right, I think that there are moments where I am making decisions and there are moments where God, where God simply doesn't give me a choice. Like I, I believe as a believer that there are things that I could not do, that the grace of God would simply not allow me to do. And then there are things that I think, because I don't think it's like this one solid, um, like operation all the time, if you get what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but that I mean, sense. I do have a will. I have a, do have a choice. I can resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit sometimes. God, the Holy Spirit can tell me to go talk to somebody and I can say no. Right. But at that point, I'm alive. 
I'm alive. I'm coherent. Like I've now gained the ability to say yes and no to things. Before I was dead. Yeah, you didn't even have the ability. Right. I was incapable of giving any answer to God in any way. So there it is. Here's a school yeah. grace. It's beautiful, That's man. Amazing. I really think it's so beautiful. Very beautiful. It's amazing. And I wish people would understand this and stop straw manning cowardice. And that's another reason why I do this. I'm doing this series. I wanted to do this. So much straw man. I don't know if you know Leighton Flowers. Leighton Flowers, but he's this guy. He 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 claimed to be a Calvinist for like ten years, but then you hear him explain Calvinist and just straw man after straw man. And I I was just like in my heart, I know a seventeen year old who can explain this better than you, Elijah Lamb. I so, <laughs> dude, I, I made a video on that on my on my doctrine account, and I was like, this is not a video teaching Calvinism. It's just to say, don't straw man it. Please, because every yeah. time you like, I'll be like, okay, describe Calvinism. And they'll say, oh, God picks who goes to heaven and hell. I'm like, first of all, that's double predestination. And that's one. You don't believe in that. Within the Calvinistic view. That is one thing that some Calvinists believe, right? Yeah. All Calvinists believe that God predestines people to heaven, but it's double predestination. And that not all Calvinists believe in hard determinism, soft determinism. There's, and then there's mm-hmm. super and supra lapsinarianism or whatever. Like, when did God elect? Was it before or after the fall? And there's, there's all of these questions within reformed yeah. theology and, and within Calvinism and in the, the, in the, the teaching of Augustine, like, which was work out, just so you know, if you're not, if, if you never heard of it, go read about Augustine because he, yes, taught, sir, he's a legend. he taught Tulip in the, in, in the 300s. Okay. It goes back that far. Just so you know, nice. I mean, it also goes back to the first century and the writing of the scripture and in the Old Testament where God, you know, himself declared, you, you read about in Isaiah in the Psalms about God having the sovereign choice over man's heart, but not the yeah. point. It's Calvinism, like Tulip, it goes back to Augustine. Um, Calvin wasn't as original as we think, though, though he put a no. label. It has been something that has been taught in the church for a very, very long time. I mean, that's why he's a reformer, because the church believed it, and then the church stopped believing it. And he was like, uh, let, me, let me remind you guys what we really believe. But yeah. um, basically, back to my point, people straw man it so hard and will say, oh, it's just simply the idea that God picks and chooses it goes to heaven and hell, which I have a lot of trouble with that explanation, as I said. And so, but, but I say, okay, don't describe it that way. If you don't know what it is, read about it and, and stop straw manning it in some comments. But wait, what is Calvinism? And the first response, basically, is that God picks and chooses goes to heaven and hell. And I was like, are you kidding? I was like, can you watch the video? What just happened? Like, why are we so stuck in this, guys? Listen, we're not a Calvinist you're watching. Calvinism is not heresy. Arminianism, Arminianism I, isn't either. I'm not going to say yeah, that it yeah, is exactly. because it doesn't compromise on the gospel. Right? It doesn't compromise on the divinity of Jesus. It doesn't compromise on the Trinity. These things that would that that would simply be you no longer understand who God is. Right? Now, if you're going to if you're going uh, if because there are some Arminians because Arminianism in itself is not heresy at all. Right. But classical. There are some Arminian, classical Arminianism. Yes, classical Arminianism because there are some Arminians who say they're Arminians, but they're really semi-Pelagians, though. To be right. Honest, I'm not gonna lie. Or, or there's, just there's some of them. Yes, that's another thing I would encourage you guys to read about is semi-Pelagianism versus classical Arminianism because I understand the classical Arminian argument. That makes sense to me. But most people who say that that they are Arminians today are actually semi-Pelagians, and it's 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 on the brink of heresy. It's right there because Pelagius yeah. was a full-on heretic who taught that, yeah. that basically that man that salvation is entirely in the hands of man, entirely. Yeah. And that's who Augustine was responding to. So this is this is this is a heresy that goes back really really far. But um, anyway, yeah, yeah, this was dope, bro. And thank you for coming on. This was awesome. Fun this conversation. Was, this was amazing. It was a, it was an amazing conversation. Um, explaining irresistible grace. And yeah, guys, if you guys this is your first time here, and if there is someone that you know who is strong in Calvinism, send them this video because we want them to stop. Okay, and hit the subscribe button hit the bell to be notified because we're doing this every single week next week i'm going to have joshua janeer you guys know him he's been on here before um he's an apologist on tiktok he's my my one of my best friends um he's going to come on and he's going to do limited atonement no that he's going to do unconditional a, election that man is a genius now, he is a genius do you know how you know he knows how to speak greek and hebrew fluently yeah he's he's insane he's he's he's, he's, he's awesome I, I I've, been been, I've been talking to him a couple times but i've been on a call with him before and i was just like I was like, whoa, yeah. dude, whoa. <laughs> Gift of knowledge going crazy right now. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's awesome, dude. But yeah, you guys watch this series because people always ask me to explain Calvinism. Right. And I'm like, I don't feel like it because it's not <laughs> something I can do in a 60 second video. It's not. It's yeah. just not. W- without, 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 you know, dumbing it down quite a bit. Um, and so I've talked about it before. I was reading some notes that I have from a Q&A I did on a, on a Zoom before. 
where I didn't even give like a super exhaustive explanation. I mean, it, it was a 20 minute explanation, all of Tulip, which is not yeah. enough time. It's not, you know, it doesn't feel like enough time. It's a lot to unpack. And so thank you, Samuel, for this series, bro. You're killing it. Um, thank you, bro. Appreciate you, it. you guys, make sure you watch all these videos because it'll That's open it. your eyes to what Calvinists actually believe. Amen. Anyway. But yeah, anyways, guys, like I said, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell to be notified, and see you guys in the next video.